welcome to our event and it's so great to have you all here. My name is Svetlana Matvienko. I'm faculty uh, at the School of Communication and Simon Fraser. And um, I uh, would like to begin by acknowledging that Simon Fraser University uh, is, uh, acknowledges uh, that it's located on the territories, on the traditional territories of Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Ketsi, Kikwetlam, Keikat, Kwantlen, Simiahu, and Tsavasan peoples on whose unceded territories our campuses are located and where many of us are right now. And I want to say a couple of words about uh, this event, this series, uh, which is the SFU School of Communication book and speaker series, uh, which uh, my colleague Zoe Druick and myself organized several years ago. And we thought of it as a space in which the School of Communication engages with recently published book by faculty or other members of our community. And our goal is to encourage fluid conversations between faculty and students, and also to celebrate the achievements of our scholarly community. Um, to think critically, to pose questions and to search for new avenues for research and activism. And I think the book that we will talk about today is a fantastic case precisely for that, for new avenues of research and activism. activism. And <clears throat> Now I will introduce the author of the book and co-author of uh, images for the book uh, and our um, uh, and another participant of our event who will be in conversation with them. So um, uh, Wendy Huikyon Chan is our Simon Fraser University's Canada 150 research chair in new media. And she has studied both system design engineering and English literature, which she combines and uh, mutates in her current work on digital media. She's an author of Control and Freedom, Power and Paranoia in the Age of Fiber Optics from MIT 2006, Programmed Vision, Software and Memory from MIT 2011, uh, updating to remain the same habitual new media from MIT again 2016 and this book discriminating that data that just came out a couple of days ago and she's also a co-author of pattern discrimination University of Minnesota and Mason Press from 2019. She has been a professor and the chair of the Department of Modern Culture and Media at Brown University, where she worked for almost two decades and where she's currently a visiting professor. She has also been a visiting scholar at the Annenberg School of uh, the University of Pennsylvania, a member of the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. She has held fellowships from the Guggenheim, uh, ACLS, American Academy of Berlin, Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard. She has been a visiting professor at AI Now Institute, uh, in, I now, uh, at NYU, uh, the Velux Visiting Professor of Management, Politics and Philosophy at the Copenhagen School of Business, uh, and the Visiting Associate Professor in the History of Science Department at Harvard, where she is an associate. Wendy is joined uh, by Alex uh, Barnett, who is a group leader for numerical analysis at the Center for Computational Mathematics at the Flatiron Institute, a division of the Simons Foundation in the New York City. His PhD was in physics at Harvard University, followed by postdoctoral work in radiology at Massachusetts General Hospital and in applied mathematics at the Cornet Institute of NYU. He has, uh, he then taught at the Department of Mathematics at Darman's College for 12 years, becoming a full professor in 2017. His research interests include computational uh, partial uh, differential equations, waves, 
fast algorithms, integral in equations, neuroscience, imaging, statistics, and inversive, inverse problems. He has published more than 50 papers, uh, received several grants from the National Science Foundation, won the 21st International Physics Olympiad, and received Darman Karen Veteran Memorial Award for Distinguished Creative and or Scholarly Achievement. And our third speaker uh, and a conversationalist today <laughs> will be Dr. Mercedes Bonds, who is a deputy head of the uh, Department of Digital Humanities and reader in digital culture and society at King's College London. She studied philosophy, art history, and media studies at the FU Berlin and the Bauhaus University Weimar, and wrote her thesis on the early history of internet protocols driven by a deep curiosity about digital technology. Until today, she hasn't been disappointed in digital technology, a field that provides her, real, uh, her re reliably with new aspects to think about. At the moment, she um, at the moment that one of those new aspects of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Mercedes uh, is heading um, a research project into creative AI at AHRC grant and co-leads a creative lab a collaboration with the Serpentine Gallery London. Her last publication was the calculation of meaning on the misunderstanding of new artificial intelligence as culture, published in the Journal of Culture, Theory, and Critique. So I welcome all the speakers, uh, and uh, I will let Mercedes begin this conversation and say a couple of words about the book and uh, just uh, start the conversation with our authors. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana, for this uh, excellent um, introduction. I'm very, everyone's probably very happy that I don't have such an impressive um, history as Wendy has, otherwise we could never get a chance to speak. And I'm super pleased and grateful uh, to be here. Um, last time um, I saw Svetlana and Wendy in person was probably in Mykonos just before COVID when we were at a conference at the organizational studies, um, which was uh, a great event as well. But we tried to make this a great event too, so don't worry. Um, I'm really pleased and also grateful that I find myself here with you both. Uh, Alex, I really enjoyed your contribution in the book. And um, Wendy knows that I follow her work long before I met her. And um, yeah, I followed the, the book, how it slowly came into the existence, um, starting with the little sister of the book. And for everyone in the UK, um, who the book came out 2nd November, which is earlier, but I ordered it on Amazon and it tells me it, doesn't be, it won't be delivered until the 24th of November. Um, probably Brexit. Um, so uh, for everyone who's very inspired and wants to read up on Wendy, there's an essay about her in this book. Um, so you can start reading that. Um, I'm really pleased also that we talk about this book, Discrimination, Discriminating Data, Correlation, Neighborhoods, and the New Politics of Recognition. Thank you, Alex, for the great collaboration here. Um, it's a much needed book about the technical realities we live in and with today. Um, yeah, chapter by chapter, the book really opens up all those black boxes we talk about so often when discussing algorithms and data analytics. The book also is in conversation with many other authors. I brought a few of them here. Um, it, it is really great how Wendy sort of incorporates lots of work that is fresh and that is out there in the book. And it is also unique because it digs deep into the technical logic of recommendation systems, machine learning, data analytics, supported by Alex's work, who explains key concepts such as correlation. Um, and uh, yeah, it uh, takes away all uh, our fear of mathematical functions with his beautiful handwriting. And I printed out a page since I don't have the book, but just a PDF here you can see. Uh, I think that's a really uh, great way um, to take the fear of all of us 
from mathematical functions. And um, I would like to come back to you both, Wendy and Alex, about this gesture and placing key concepts such as correlation, magnetic polarization, Bayesian theorems, and so on, very central to this book. I think uh, there are five contributions by you, Alex, explaining um, what our network world is built upon. Um, yeah. Before we go into these details, I'll give a very, very brief idea about the book. I think you should all read it yourself, so I will be very brief. Um, discriminating data, correlation, neighborhoods, and the new politics of recognition is working through processes of big data and machine learning. Drilling down into those technologies, it reveals profound social and cultural assumptions that push those technologies in dangerous directions, one has to say, nowadays. One example which Wendy discusses in excellent detail is that the contemporary public sphere, made up in large parts now of our social media platforms, treats polarization as a goal and not as an error. To work against this, the book looks critically at recommender systems that foster angry clusters of sameness through homophily, and we're going to talk about that. It looks at correlations that are blatantly obvious, but sold to us as impressive insights. The usage of machine learning algorithms as surveillance of the poor, and it criticizes not the technology, but our way of applying it. And that's something I got really excited about when reading it. Um, I found in parts, and Wendy, you can say, no, that's actually just your projection, Mercedes. I found some interesting traces of Kittler's media determine our situation. So together with Alex, I think you both dig deep into the mechanisms used in our algorithmic society. And the society is based on co correlations, Bayesian probabilities, linear discriminative analysis, and all those things. And it is the effect of these mechanisms of media that the book criticizes. And uh, for Wendy, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, to be determined by our media only goes so far. And there, I think you depart a bit from Kittler. It only goes so far as we let them. And this is what I really, really loved about this book. The book is as much a critique of digital technology as it is a defense of digital technology. It's drawing out possibilities of another world. And um, it does push digital technology not away. It draws it closer, literally, by turning towards mathematical, statistical, and physical concepts and the history. Well, Wendy's work always lift from insights um, that you have, Wendy, as a systems design engineer. And um, Svetlana and me talked about it when we prepared this conversation. And we both thought interdisciplinarity was always more than just a buzzword in your work. Um, this time I noticed that you engage on quite a regular basis with computational concepts, with computer science papers, seminal works published in the field of computer science and the computer scientist himself, <laughs> life. <laughs> so um, I think the book helps us to switch our attention a bit as we live uh, through the move away from mass media to polarized networks, the engagement with computational key concepts meant for me that when we want to understand the forces that shape our polarized networks, we need to gain more insights into the functioning of network media because to quote a fellow Canadian of you, the medium is the message. So um, here's where I come to my first question. Um, with big data, and this is a bit to you both, Alex and Wendy, um, with big data and data analysis being pushed further by machine learning, how important is it that we gain more digital literacy? How important is it to understand the key concepts underlying the network media we live with? Um, I am also thinking here um, about your work together. Um, why did you both feel it important that these concepts are explained? And how did you do two come to work together? Wendy, do you want to go first? How did we work together? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, we can answer the question together. It'll be an exciting uh, <laughs> move for us to talk about this together. So why don't we start with um, the question about how important it is to be literate in these concepts? 
um, because that goes into why one would have in a trade paperback um, equations and drawing chalkbook drawings um, taken from um, mathematical concepts. And here I think that one thing that we were trying to do in the book is to say a lot of people often with machine learning and other programs will say, look, they're too opaque. We, we don't know what they're doing. And, and that's true that um, the results of neural nets, for instance, are very opaque. Um, but, it, but people are opaque. Um, I don't know, Mercedes, everything about your biological structure, but I don't think I need to know your biological structure in order for us to have a conversation. And what's interesting about a lot of the machine learning and data analysis is that they're using off-the-shelf programs or they're using the same concepts over and over again. And so what struck us as key is first of all to uh, refuse the gesture of transparency equals understanding, right? Because things can be transparent and completely misunderstood. And here I think Mom and Malik's point that if we want to talk about transparency in these programs, we should talk about to what extent they represent the phenomenon they're supposed to rather than can we read the models themselves. Um, which doesn't mean that explainability isn't important. And I think Cynthia Rudin is doing some really great work around um, understanding explainable models. But the larger problem with these models come from their fundamental um, axiomatic assumptions, such as homophily, similarity beats connection, such as correlation. Um, and those were the, the concepts that I think it's really key for us to grapple with and think anew, right? This is all about interdisciplinarity and us thinking anew of these fundamental concepts so we produce different um, fundamental concepts that, that bear witness to the diversity of world around us. Yes, uh, that's exactly some of the things I was going to say uh, about um, understanding quite standard statistical techniques that are not that, that they are used again and again for marketing for social media for for, for recommendations and, and for grouping uh friends and and all of these things that that shape uh especially the younger generations online uh behavior come from that there's there's first you, sh you should understand the mathematics behind them and it's not that hard usually and uh, so we we wanted to explain with examples and in a accessible language and and uh, but also I mean what I learned from Wendy was the like a lot about the history of, of where the assumptions come from and it's very revealing to to see the uh, to, to know the history of an algorithm um, rather than just be taught oh this is what you do you you turn this crank and you get this answer. You know, so I mean, one example is that 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 I discovered. I mean, through uh, researching and 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 these uh, inserts was like things like linear discriminant an analysis comes from uh, the history of uh, the British uh, co colonial India uh, under the British um, segregating the castes and using biometrics to to separate the castes. Um, so that's Built these assumptions about that people should be separated and should be clustered by similarity, and just to sit, you know, really influence the in these algorithms, and then they just become packages, and everyone just uses them without question. So it's really important to understand what what they are and where they where they come from historically, and then question them. Uh, so, and in terms of working together, uh, so Wendy and I have known each other twenty years. Um, actually through the Radcliffe Fellowship where my wife, Liz Kanna, um, was a colleague of Wendy's. Since then, I wrote two papers with Wendy's husband, who's an ecologist, and, and that uh, went so well. that And then Wendy and I started, Wendy used one of my diagrams in, a, in the background to one of her slides. And then we were like, she was like, why don't we do some more of those diagrams? Why don't we try and explain these things? So uh, yes, so that was, that's how this ended up happening, and then uh, it's it's been a it's very rare to have this uh, cross disciplinary um, engagement. I think you know, uh, so I, I'm glad it happened. It was really fun. 
Yeah, it's excellent. And but I also really feel that as a society, we are at a point where we really need this uh, cross disciplinary work, because the algorithms have such an influence that this kind of literacy is really needed. I mean, we just spoke about the history and maybe just stay with this point of eugenics. When, he, when do you show the correlation between, um, I know that how correlation and eugenics or the history of these algorithms are deeply influenced by eugenics. Maybe, um, yeah, tell us a bit more about this, um, where, how you develop the link. So it was really um, starting, so with all my books, I start with a concept and then I always move backwards and I always try to figure out what's strange about the concept. I also always look for footnotes. I go to sources and I look for footnotes. Um, what was so strange to me about correlation, of course, is that when everybody was declaring with big data, you know, correlation's the new thing, it's gonna change the world. I had done some research on eugenics um, for my for program visions, but the more the Mendelian versus the biometric. Um, and I was I was reading that I it, it sounded exactly like Pearson to me. Um, and of course he was talking about and Galton were both talking about correlation at the beginning of the 20th century and how that would fundamentally change knowledge um, and that it would lay the grounds for eugenics. And why correlation was so important for them was because it enabled them, they argued, to figure out what doesn't change in time. So what stays the same between the past and the present and therefore the future. And their idea was once we have these unchanging traits um, uh, in place, then we can program the future. Then we know what the future will look like. And so what they tried to do was very much to close the future. Um, so the fact that we now think of correlation and big data is disrupting of, of the future and, and opening all these opportunities is really strange when you could consider that this comes from a technology that was meant to close down the future. Um, and that's where I argue this is a lot of the, the reason why we feel so imprisoned within these, these programs and these correlations. But what's also so key for me is that correlation presumes that repetition equals truth. Um, that if something repeats, then it must be true. Um, and that is, as Hannah Arendt has argued, is, is, the, is to, to actually destroy the concept of truth. Um, and so if we try to look for different ways of understanding truth using these tools, but understanding their limitations, what else can emerge? Because my point isn't that everyone who uses correlation is a eugenicist. In fact, I talk about the importance of correlation to global climate change models, etc. cetera, um, but that what correlation does is, and, and what these statistical models do, is show you what the future would like, look like if we didn't change our present actions based though on a highly selective past that's fed in. In fact, mm -hmm. we know the problem is often the past that's fed in is, is, is a deep fake, right? So dirty police records, Hollywood stars as the basis for facial recognition technology. Deep fakes aren't produced by these programs. Deep fakes ground these programs. Um, so part of that is to, to think through what are the implications of that and this, uh, this concept that truth or learning is equals repetition. And then, um, because uh, what the eugenicists used correlation for was to show that learning was couldn't happen. So it's really strange. Okay, mm -hmm. so this concept which was put in place to show that learning actually couldn't happen is now grounding machine learning. Um, at, but to say that therefore if the world seems so close, closed now, it's, it's this presumption of truth equals repetition, but that we can use these models and these predictions to do other things. Um, yeah, and you show this um, uh, really great. I mean, um, in a certain sense, you writing about the history of eugenics shows how they were managed management of the poor and to keep the poor segregated. And you make this really great link to what's contemporary going on with algorithms. Um, and you have the examples, Chicago Police Department strategic subject lists, uh, which mingles together victims and murderers and then blames the victims more or less, you know, on that they have become victims. And the same with the Alenghi family screening tool um, uh, used in Pennsylvania, I think, which um, 
determined the risk of child abuse and neglect, but then when you become involved with the welfare system, later on, uh, there was a prediction that the likelihood as adults to neglect their own children is being predicted. And I think it's these two, uh, this element where you say, well, eugenics was a tool against the poor. And again, we are just doing the same thing. And if I understand you correctly, you don't say it's wrong to use the algorithms, it's, but you say it's wrong to use them in this way, right? Yeah, so, so what's key again, what you're bringing out is that one legacy of eugenics that we see is the idea that we're all lab rats, right? Um, so when, you know, the social dilemma shows us in, you know, being experimented on, um, it's part of this longer history of social experimentation that we need to keep in mind. This social experimentation isn't new, the social engineering isn't new. It's, it's in these very concepts themselves. But I think part of what the book is trying to do is say, well, let's rethink correlation. I mean, um, for instance, psychoanalysis, um, Lacan talks about correlation, um, but the kinds of relations that he talks about, which again are at the surface, it's like reading, it, it's uneerily um, similar, but what happens in psychoanalytic, um, correlation is you have condensation and you have displacement, you have metonymy and metaphor, you have a very different type of relation that is important in co-relation. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of this is to say, if we're going to think about correlation, we have to think about co-relation and how co-relation is, is a means for um, intervention and opening up. Um, but Alex, um, your You've, you have a deep history in statistics. So part of what was so exciting about us working together, which started with the Netflix diagram and latent factors, um, was then thinking through and with these concepts. Yes, I, I, I'm just going to bring up the correlation, uh, some of the inserts here, because, I mean, it, it's so misused. That That's what's so interesting, right, that these... So, I mean, I'll just hold this up because this is one of the inserts, right? Uh, the first one on correlation. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was, there are these metrics that everybody just takes for granted now about what, you know, and, and some A correlated with B, like, uh, and th this, this data here is uh, actually sort of pulled from this open source statistics package that you can, easily download and play with the data and plot it. You know, so this, this shows uh, median household income on the x-axis versus uh, then uh, percentage of, of African-American in, in the county and in, in all of the county and each dot is a different county in the US. So you can apply the, you can measure the correlation coefficient here, um, which is this number R that everyone sort of assumes tells you what's going on. And it will tell you that, oh, indeed, that there is some, uh, that if you move to, to higher incomes, then you notice less percentage African-American in, in, you know, in, in, in each of these counties. Okay, so there is a, a slight, you can plot the correlation coefficient, which is the tool everyone uses. And it's, it's slightly negative, which tells you that that, that effect is there. But there's so much more in the data that you get by actually being a human being and looking at the data and looking even at this plot. And you can see things like that when you get down to low uh, income uh, counties, then it's, uh, it's very segregated, right? You see people are either almost 0% African-American or, you know, or more than half. So there's mm. this split and that's completely ignored by correlation coefficient. And in fact, all algorithms would um, probably just use, I mean, you know, it's common to just use that to go and deduce things statistically. So it, the, you know, the num you shouldn't trust the standard numbers and you should look at the data. I mean, that's kind of one of the lessons here. Uh, so we kind of wanted to use, and, and this brings up exam, you know, examples about like, what is a surrogate, uh, for um, one attribute people have, like, you know, race can be a, uh, or income can be a surrogate for race. So uh, this, Wendy explains all of this in the book that, 
you know, you can have an algorithm that you think is just measuring one quantity like uh, income, but in fact, you're measuring race. And in this case, you're measuring uh, racial uh, segregation, amount of segregation as well, things like that. So you, you can't, if you just run uh, black box algorithms or uh, to, to make deductions, even in science, then, then you, you get completely, uh, but you know, you can reinforce biases that um, you have to question and look, look at the data. Mm. Human beings need to look at this and the algorithms need to be publicly available so people can question them uh, around the world, you know? So, I mean, we haven't even gotten to the corporate, uh, the money-making aspect of all of this, so which I hope we'll get to talk about, like what, why, why are we the, uh, why are we the lab rats in so many algorithms uh, as, as internet users? Oh yeah, let's uh, continue exactly that question. Why are we the lab rats? I mean, it is um, something uh, that you discuss in the beginning of the book, both in great extent, right? The danger that of correlations being used in building communities and how social networks amplify racism and other violent prejudices. So um, yeah, I think you, why are we the lab rats here? Why is this being done? Well, uh, so one thing I just want to say is, is what's really important to realize is when we talk about proxies, um, income isn't a proxy for race. Income is a proxy for racism. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what's really important is to not accept the, the, the ways even that these, these relations are brought to us, but use it to open up other questions. Um, I think in terms of why are we the lab rats for these um, uh, social media questions, I mean, this goes into some of the issues I know Alex wants to discuss in terms of monetization um, and the ways in which um, certain behaviorist models are at the basis of these social media platforms. Um, and what's important to me is that, uh, in, and again, think through all the discussion people have about dopamine, et cetera, addiction in terms of our social media um, usage. Um, these are profoundly behaviorist understandings of human beings. Mm -hmm. And my point in the book isn't that they don't work, but to ask ourselves, what do we need in place in order for them to work? both in terms of the economic model Alex is going to talk about, but the, also for me, the, the incredible amounts of agitation um, that need to take place in order for us to be triggered and to click or do things in the ways that are prescribed. And for me, what's absolutely key is that we become most predictable um, when we're most agitated. And we become agitated not when we're with people who are different than us, but rather when we're clustered around people who are like us. So, and this is what the Facebook whistleblower really showed nicely, right? So the mm -hmm. presumption was if you're with people like you, then somehow this would be a safe space. It was the opposite. Once you, know, you were put into that um, feed with your friends and family, it became a worse space. And so for me, what's key to think through how networks operate is like imagine, and, and Alex did a great drawing for this one, but I was like, Alex, you know what it is? It's like a bunch of iron filings. Um, and then you take the magnets on either side and what happens actually visually is a network emerges. You see connections and networks depend on creating these gaps amongst masses. And then what you have at both end are, are, are um, filings that are similar, but because they're so similar, they repel each other, but they're stuck together, but because they're so attracted to the opposite. Um, and so I think that thinking through this is actually really profound because then it gets us to how, do, how are we then in the situation to be triggered or to act um, in certain behaviorist ways. And the other point of that is really trying to think through authenticity. Um, and in the ways in which social media platforms call on us to be authentic by revealing open secrets about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we, and these open secrets are key to creating these clusters um, from which uh, we become more agitated and act in certain ways and can be effectively monetized, which I know Alex wants to discuss. <laughs> Well, okay. I, I mean, this is, if you've been on planet Earth in the last uh, few weeks, you'll have 
you know, we, we, things are starting to swing in our favor in terms of some big whistleblower uh, exposés of Facebook and, and Instagram and all of this internal data that these companies are well aware of that they have uh, studied themselves, just like the fossil fuel industry studied climate change just uh, internally, just like the cigarette industry studied uh, cancer internally. You know, it's it's kind of sh shocking that that that, that the, this is the you know it's the it's the lung cancer of our time mm -hmm. that, that is known. It's sort of open secret um, how damaging uh, the, the the model is, and that's because we are not the the, the customer. Um, I mean, I'm saying something obvious here, but we uh, the customer are the advertiser. The, 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 comp the corporations that advertise on Facebook, Google, uh, YouTube, every, uh, everything, uh, we are the product. And uh, we happen to, but why do, we, why do we become a product? Well, because they happen to offer this free, this nice free thing called Gmail or Facebook or, or you know, that, that it's completely flipped from the way people think, you know. E even when you're, you're buying stuff, even when there's a recommendation system on Amazon that's that's suggesting things for you to buy, right? You are then the product because Amazon is working for the companies to, to, to sell, to get you to buy more stuff or the things that they think you'll buy. Mm. So, so that's why we're being experimented on all the time. I mean, because we are, um, they're trying more efficient ways to, to, to sell us as a product to, to companies that are, that are paying. So, so one solution here, I mean, Mercedes, I know you, uh, you, in, in, our, in our prior email, you, you, you asked us to think about solutions, which is, uh, that's, a tough, that's a tough one. And, and positive examples. Let's positive. not call it solutions okay. because solutions have, have now a bad rep. <laughs> but, you know, if you take a, a, like the New York Times or a newspaper, right, you, you pay, you are actually the customer and then journalists do work to, to inform you, right? Yeah. It's total. that's a positive model. Uh, and we need, you know, what the web to go back to more like to journalism and, and I mean, maybe you need a service that where you pay and you then, uh, um, you're the customer. So I, I don't know that that's one that that would flip the, um, yeah, the, 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 the monetary, uh, you know, this massive, uh, and this is why so many scientists are going to, to work in, in machine learning and, 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 and all of the students that they're training want to do machine learning projects and deep learning and science because they all want to be good for job prospects for to go and work at Facebook and Google afterwards. I mean, yeah. seeing, for me in, in science, we're seeing this massive sucking sound uh, towards uh, yeah. deep learning. Yeah, 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 no. I mean, um, what I really, um, I can just uh, confirm and I find it really good. I think um, the book is really going in great length and depth and this is really needed into what happens at the moment in our societies due to, um, well, a certain effect networks and network science has. And um, Wendy, I think I've never, yeah, I think the theory of homophily, I mean, uh, you, it's, uh, you do really great research, you go into the archive of Meriton and really trace it all back, how it comes from housing and the segregation of housing. And one understands so much better what really happens uh, and where we are at in our society. And I just um, read a short quote, um, that you see that is dangerous and that you both make it really clear, and I quote, in an attempt to destroy any and all senses of commonality, communities are being planned and constructed based on divisions and animosities. Instead of ushering in a post-racial, post-identitarian era, these social networks perpetuate angry micro-identities through default variables and axioms. And this is being done also because this helps people to sell us stuff uh, and we are shaped in that manner. So yeah, um, that is pretty uh, dark. <laughs> that was also why I sort of asked, uh, do we have positive examples? I mean, uh, before I come to them and you give five examples, what we should do now and we should also open up this to questions. So please people start typing your questions into the chat. 
Um, the aspect of neoliberalism is an aspect that runs through the book constantly, um, but at times you really engage also with theorists like David Harvey or Wendy Brown, um, and you quote Phil Ager arguing against capture, and I really like him. Uh, I think he's also an early critic of neoliberalism from a computational side. Um, so uh, this interchange of market and networks, can you maybe comment on that? I mean, Alex already did a good job on that, but maybe. He, there's so much there. I think that one thing that I was fascinated by is the way is in which exit is now celebrated. Um, and exit uh, was so, so what's so interesting about homophily, and again, as you pointed out, homophily, which is the idea that similarity breeds connection, um, comes from studies of US residential segregation. Um, and to go back to your question about what are the positive examples, what are the differences, you can go back to that study. Um, mm -hmm. Because even though um, they say that, uh, and, and it's, a very, it's, it's a very strange study um, and a very important one that actually had an impact on how housing developed in the United States of America. Um, so it was done right after World War II. It was unclear, should there be more public housing? Should there be private housing? There's a huge debate about what to do. And so they did this, this housing study where they interviewed members, every member of uh, in um, New Jersey. And it had to be white because it was a co-op. Um, and the other one was a biracial housing project in Pennsylvania, actually in Pittsburgh. Um, and although it was, it was biracial, um, it was not integrated, but it was divided, the races were divided by building or by floor. Um, and the, the question, they, they did a huge questionnaire, um, but they asked people, who are your three closest friends, regardless mm -hmm. of where they live? Um, and do you think people in the housing project get along? And do you think housing should be biracial? And they wanted to show, again, in this article, they said there's homophily and there's heterophily. We don't know when that happens, but they said when homophily happens, it's due to value homophily. And to make that point, they said white liberals overselect white liberals and white illiberals overselect white illiberals. Um, and to make this point, they actually threw out the response of, of all the black residents. And, and at no point was there just a category called liberal, which included both black and white residents. Um, and they also threw out uh, the responses of the largest white residents who, who were indifferent. So they thought that um, housing projects shouldn't be biracial, but that people got along. Um, and so what's key is if you go back to that study, you see that there were traces of friendships as opposed to the question, who are your three closest friends? There was another two questions. Do you have friends of the other race? And do you have acquaintances of the other race? And those were overwhelmingly yes. Um, so homophily as a concept didn't have to emerge from this study because even within the original study, there were different forms of connection mm -hmm. and friendship that could have been the basis for our networks. Um, and so that's for me absolutely key. And then where I go from the, the move from eugenics to um, the new eugenics and to our current state um, is the ways in which homophily is now being weaponized so that what's desirable um, is exit. Um, so eugenicists um, in the 20th century thought that we needed eugenics so that the population as a whole could progress. Um, and what's so interesting with the weaponization of homophily is that there's this celebration now of exiting. Um, like you can think of the sovereign individuals or you can think of um, the, the, the seasteaders, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what's so intriguing for me is that they often say, look, our model is the black, is the civil rights movement and black liberation. Mm. Um, and so there's this really odd, and even within these key texts that found neoliberalism, there's this, there's this move to say what's really odd are black liberation movements because they're not taking the normal path to success. And I think thinking through this sort of bizarre way in which discrimination um, uses the, the politics of recognition in order to further discrimination is also key to understanding the different market logics that are in place. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I think we're going to soon move to the questions. Um, Svetlana, give me a sign when we should. Um, otherwise, I have one more point that I really liked in the book, and that was maybe we can touch on that very briefly. And you mentioned it earlier, that is the difference of climate change and how machine learning is understood in climate change and how we understand machine learning as a stupid form of prediction. Yeah, so what's key is I'm talking about programs more generally. There are very few climate change models that use machine learning. Yeah. Um, um, so what's key for me, though, is that climate change models, um, you get, use statistics, right? And they use proxies um, in order to show us the most likely future based on the past. Um, but they show us the most likely future based on the past. And again, a highly selected past, not so we'll accept it and not so we'll accelerate it, but so we'll intervene. And that to me is really key. And global climate change models make absolutely clear the difference between being correct and being true. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be correct, right? The point mm -hmm. is, if you believe in a global climate change model, you'll act in such a way that you'll never know if a specific um, prediction is correct. Um, and also, when a global climate change model um, shows a 2% increase in temperature, you seek to change the world, not the model. Um, and that's the way I think we should approach these discriminatory algorithms, like Compass, which has been shown to discriminate against uh, racial minorities in terms of um, sentencing. Now, what's really interesting about Compass is that it was sold during the Obama administration as a way to get rid of racism because you get you got rid of individual mm -hmm. bias, you got rid of judges' bias, but you got rid of individual bias. But then, what which was accentu um, accentuated was institutional bias, and mm -hmm. what Compass actually shows us, um, because it's it, it what what it relies on most are age at first time of arrest, right, and that is an indication of racism. Um, it, within uh, the United States and Canada, mm -hmm. um, and other, other things such as income, et cetera, and education. And so we can read these results against the grain as evidence of and ways to diagnose um, the ways in which discrimination operates in our society. But again, for me, why it's so important about global climate change models is that they've been around a long time. Mm. You know, they've been true for a long time. Knowing something's true and provoking action are two entirely different things. And what's also key is that George W. Bush poured more money into um, global climate change models than any president before him because um, he didn't know if it was true or not, right? So we needed more models. And that, in effect, bought more time for polluters. So I think the other message is, do we really need more models? And when does the building of models become an alibi um, for political inaction? Mm. Okay, I think we have a number of questions. Um, Svetlana, do you want to or shall I engage with them? Uh, either. Uh, yes, we have several. Come on, join us. <laughs> yes, okay. Yeah, so we have several questions and thank you everyone for typing them in. So I will read your names and questions. So the first one from Salva Hawk. I'm sorry if I'm reading your name incorrectly. Uh, this is a question about deep fakes. So uh, deep fakes, uh, and is related to the dangers that machine learning can have in society. Deep fakes can generate harmful videos and consequences. And many scholars working on deep fake detectors and STEM emphasize that such that since human beings cannot detect extremely sophisticated deep fakes, only machine learning can, can combat machine learning. What is your opinion on this approach? Theoretically, what are some alternate approaches to detecting and combating harmful deepfakes? Um, maybe I'll, I, I can say a little. Um, mm -hmm. th this isn't a new problem, right? We've, there have been 100 years ago, there were fake black and white photographs done through multiple uh, exposures to film, you know, the fairies in the back of the garden. We've had deep fakes for a long time, uh, and it always just requires detective work. And 
we have to fund journalists and academics and research, you know, people to do to to dig these things out. Then computers won't be able to do it alone. I mean, I, I'll mention a former colleague of mine, Hani Farid, who's now works for Photoshop, uh, for Adobe, and uh, they detect whether Im uh, camera images have been uh, manipulated by using statistics of the uh, that the original images should have from the detectors. So you can do this kind of thing. And I think it just requires very detailed work and uh, it's important to support. Uh, it's always a cat and mouse game though. And, and it, it always has been, it, it's, it's not in its nature new. Yes, and the other thing I would say is, is for me the most dangerous thing is the fact that the past that's fed into these, the ground truth is deep fake. So when we talk about deep fakes as the product, we're actually missing the ways in which the reality that's fed in, the ground truth is itself a deep fake. Um, and that I think op opens up a different way of even understanding um, deep fakes and their history. Yeah, that's a, also such a nice moment in the book where you really make both clear that um, when we enter data into an algorithm, that's already an abstraction from the world and is a simplification. Um, and, you know, if we take this into account, that's fine. But if we just ignore it, um, it's a problem. And we do ignore it. And we seem to say these are more true than anything else, the data that we put in. So We have a question from James Smithies, and he asks of uh, to what degree you think the scale and associated cost of internet infrastructure will make it more difficult to reign in the large internet companies because only they can afford the infrastructure indeed to run the services models. Etc. And by extension, how reasonable and feasible it is to assume the scale and cost are so large now that government has an important role to play as future social media or platform providers. What is, can we or should we uh, socialize global networks to some degree? And maybe it's also to this, I will also add a kind of my question that I had which was about that activism. So is there any, but knowing this, right? Or learning this with your work and the work of others. So how we can, what kind of action can be done as a form of activism? So I think one thing that we need to do is not accept the defaults um, and to work with, um, people across disciplines um, to come up with different ways of understanding and thinking through relation. Um, for instance, uh, one thing I point to in the book is um, if we think about networks and connection, what really connects most of us together is indifference. Um, like think of everything we don't, if, if you ride the bus, think of everything you have to not care about in order to ride the bus. Um, think about nodding strangers, et cetera, et cetera. So what's interesting to me is that the network is actually everything except usually the connections that are drawn. And if we pay attention to the gaps and what's teeming in these gaps, what, what emerges is a profoundly different understanding of our interrelationship. Um, that's key to intervening into and rethinking these models. Um, in terms of infrastructure, I think that we need to rethink infrastructure. I mean, do we really need all these server farms? Do we need this, this kind of analysis, et cetera? If you wanted something very simple that did X, Y, and Z, you wouldn't need this massive infrastructure that's in place. I mean, the example I would give is, I don't know how many of you have experienced the US healthcare versus say Canadian healthcare. Um, and what's interesting about U.S. healthcare is you can say, yes, it's, it's one of the best in the world, but almost all that money is spent on, you know, like the first 30 minutes of any visit is what's your health insurance, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's like all this, this money that's spent on even actuaries trying to figure out what, who should be charged what based on their risks, right? Um, you could get rid of all of that and just come up with a, a cost for everyone for the same thing 
Um, and it's very simple. And it, 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 it does the same thing, but in an entirely different way. So I think that we need to push back, especially given global climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Do we need these server farms? Do we need this kind of analysis? When do we need it? When do we don't? Well, um, and then I think it shifts. But in terms of government regulation, I mean, what's absolutely, we need government regulation, but we need to be very careful about what something like government regulation would look like. If I may add to that, what I really like in the book um, is that the book, a, a lot of times when we criticize um, internet companies, we become motionless. It's like, you know, it's like they are so big and so powerful and we have no leeway to deal with them. And I really like that the book doesn't fall into this trap, but sort of um, shows, okay, this is how it works. And a lot of times you sort of pull away the veil. Let's take the Netflix challenge, for example, where you talk about and you say, okay, they developed really complex algorithms, but in the end, they actually didn't apply them. They applied much simpler ones. So a lot of times these companies also sell to us the myth that everything's so difficult, everything's so large, only they can do it, taking away action from us. And I think I really like the gesture this book makes by showing no, actually, you know, there are there is potential to do something and to understand technology from a different angle. And I think that's really great. <laughs> and if I can briefly add, we really need good, uh, re like, to support academic research that exposes the how the the grouping with some people who are similar to yourself ends up. Uh, creating more polarization politically, uh, racially, and, and uh, ends up damaging people. And, and this is, you know, it, the thing that came to mind actually just is in a completely different area that I care about, and that's uh, student housing. And there was some amazing research that where anthropologists embedded themselves in a sorority house where it, it was in the Midwest. They're all of the, the women are very homogenous. They're all like basically white women from the Midwest in the same sorority. And they studied like how the, 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 the fact that everybody was the same uh, led to more dangerous behavior because it, it, bred to, it led to competition, uh, popularity contests, these kinds of things. I mean, so that means that randomizing student housing is a great idea for creating more, more human beings who are, who are themselves uh, uh, well-educated and, and um, able to, you know, to, to treat other people like human beings. And we need that in, we need the research on social networking algorithms that randomize people, that create groups that are uh, um, like well-functioning groups and diverse groups rather than a group, group you with everybody who thinks the same way. So, uh... mm -hmm. the question from Ken Morales is about solutions or uh, positive examples. What possibilities do you see in these same tools for a praxis of resistance or regulation? Or what changes do you think need to happen, do you see happening to reverse the usual hierarchical structure of big data, big corps, government working on the populace? For instance, using machine learning to make a bad cop predictor. Ken, uh, he was one of my students from my very, I think my first two years as a professor at Brown. So when I was very young, um, thanks for being here and thanks for your question. Um, so um, I think, yes, absolutely, they can be used for resistance. I think that the, the bad cop predictor is, is a fascinating one. And again, part of my thing is, well, let's use these against the grain as historical probes rather than as predictors. Um, and if we use them as historical probes, they can actually reveal quite nicely the logics of domination because they're built by the logics of domination. Um, and so that I think is absolutely key. Um, USC has built this really interesting, uh, through the Gina Davis Center has produced um, 
this really interesting analysis using facial recognition technology to go through the Hollywood archive to see how, how many women there are and what, whether or not they have speaking roles. So I think definitely given the sort of history that's understood in these models, using them to understand historical trends is important. But I think the larger move is to say, the, the fundamental logic of history that is embedded in these programs is, is wrong. Um, it, like it, it presumes a certain homogeneous empty time. It presumes that, um, that certain things are sources of information. Um, like as Faulkner famously said, you know, past isn't dead, it's not even yet past. Or as Ariella Azulai has argued, um, rather than treat people as sources of information, we should treat people within the archive as our companions. Or as Kara Keeling argues, we need to, to listen to the worlds and that are still existing, but that get ignored by this certain conception of progress and history. Um, I think again, and this is something Alex brought up, we need different kinds of, of network science models. We need to think through um, heterophily. We need to think through indifference. We need to work with people. I was just on a panel with um, um, Laszlo Barabazi, um, and it was interesting to think through because data scientists and network scientists, as humanists, were profoundly aware of the limitations of our own methods. Um, and I think that interdisciplinary work has to start from our sense of what's broken in our own disciplines. It's because we know the limitations of our own disciplines that we work with others and others who do something different than us. Mm -hmm. Alex, do you want to add anything? I, I, no, I don't. I, 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 I put a link to the, the Elizabeth Armstrong's work on, the, on this, uh -huh. another aspect of housing that people might find interesting, but mm -hmm. it's basically making the same points that Wendy made with, in her deep dive into the housing project research that she does in the book. So mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to, to, to check out now. But uh, yeah, we know you need to leave. I, so I, thank I, you I, so I, much I, for being I, with I, us in this amazing conversation and for your fantastic contributions. to Yeah, them. thanks for your drawings. <laughs> <laughs> that's really amazing. I really think that's great. It's a great way to lead people to, you know, deal more with what we actually all work with every day in our phones you know and i think we all need to understand that more and your handwriting helps <laughs> thanks a lot it's been it was a lot of fun uh and i hope they you know anyone can out uh, can feel free to contact me if there's something that's not clear um but i hope they can be used in the classroom and so that that mathematics is brought into uh the humanities uh as well yeah. and that, that you know to question these things and understand them so and thanks again, Wendy, for such an amazing, inspirational uh, set of ideas. And it's been a pleasure working, assisting you with them, with uh, explaining some of them. So, uh, oh, you know, congratulations. Done more than assisting. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to, to think together. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was, it's really so important that we have these kinds of collaborations and that mathematicians aren't th scared of theory and, and theorists aren't scared of math. and that we can all uh, work together on the problems we care about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I'm not, I, you should all continue talking and I'm going to uh, uh, keep the, I, I have to, to head out, but thanks again, everyone. That's thanks, nice Alex. To keep the discussion going. All right, cheers, bye. Right, and we still have a couple of questions. So um, I'll read this next question, which is addressed to Wendy. Um, uh, from Mihila Natarian, if, if I read uh, the name correctly. Dr. Chan, you said earlier that you began uh, studying English lit after the Montreal massac massacre. You explain how you were drunk on the cool aid of engineering up until that point. If you were uh, an early stage research student today, and you did not have a system engineering background, what would you want to immerse yourself in, in the aftermath mass of Cambridge Analytica or Facebook implosion? I think that statistics is, is really so key now in understanding basic statistical concepts, because really they're not hard. 
And mm -hmm. I think what the other thing we have to realize is that a lot of scientists, especially and engineering students nowadays, like when I was in engineering, we used to do like linear, um, uh, we used to do everything by hand, right? So it was uh, linear algebra, et cetera. You'd go for the determinants, the eigenvalues, et cetera. Now you just put a line in to a, uh, a program and anybody can do this. It's actually not that difficult. Um, but I think that um, what's so key now is, is to understand some of these basic statistical concepts and to push back on them and to um, engage with uh, the richness of human experience in relationship to, to st statistics and some of these basic methods. But I would say that I am so happy that I did engineering as a background um, for many reasons. Uh, but one thing is what was so crucial to me as an engineer is that you realize that um, nobody knows everything. Like, mm. <laughs> it, it's this amazing, the more you engage technology, the more you know you, what you can't know. And you don't have this myth of like, oh, if I only knew everything, um, then I could intervene or understand X, Y, and Z. And so I think that engaging with technology and understanding the difference between a model and how things operate, um, thinking through some of these basic concepts of correlation, um, uh, linear discriminant analysis, et cetera, is just so key um, in order for us to, to make the kinds of interventions that are needed. Thanks, Wendy. And we have uh, two more questions that were posted earlier, and we are gonna take them maybe. So we still have a couple of minutes. So the question from Debs Grayson, uh, who says that it's really uh, interesting conversation. Uh, I work on campaign on public media and we were just talking yesterday about recommendation system on public media, uh, video on demand platforms such as the BBC iPlayer. This currently mirror Netflix, et cetera, by recommending similar things in contrast to traditional ideas on the broadcast schedule, which is meant to put a range of content in front of the audiences. Do you know of people working on non-homophilic algorithms that could work better in the public interest as public broadcaster move online? Yeah, so the, what's interesting is that a lot of companies realize the limits of homophily because the problem of homophily is that they contain um, users within a certain universe and they want to sell you things. So they look at randomization and also, um, some of them look at heterophily, right? So giving you the opposite um, in order to diversify. So there's some work that's being done on the commercial end um, to think through this. Um, I think as well, there's more theoretical work. Uh, uh, Giulio Della Riva, who's based in uh, New Zealand at Christchurch, has been looking at ways to make heterophilic recommendations um, uh, based on evolutionary understandings of um, concepts. And so I think there is a real push to do it. Um, I think that uh, what's key is that more of us start thinking through not just um, heterophily, but also indifference and other ways of thinking through networks. But I think this is a concept that many people understand need to be taken up. And to be quite honest, it's unclear that it's necessarily going to be the answer. Um, because one could easily imagine the weaponization of heterophilic um, uh, recommenders as well, but I think what's key is to move us away from the agitated polarization of homophilic um, recommenders. Yeah, thank you. And the last question that we have in our chat for today is from Vinod Belly, and it's uh, who is interested to know about the internal studies by the big tech that recognize the weaknesses of the mathematical models and how does any recognition uh, and internal acknowledgement of the computational flaws speaks to the intentionality uh, of big tech logics. Very interesting. I think that what's so key is that um, in terms of the flaws of these mathematical models, um, it points again to the, to the flaws or the limits of behavioralist understandings of human beings. Um, and that, uh, therefore, everything that it goes outside of a certain behavioralist understanding, which is so much, 
um, clearly is that gap between the model and reality. Um, and I think that, you know, there's the subprime attention crisis book that um, Huang wrote, um, which argues that basically um, the attention economy is like the subprime mortgage one. It's, it's built on BS and that um, we need to really question how uh, the attention economy doesn't work. Um, there's people within the humanities and social sciences who have been pushing against these sort of behaviorist models for a long time. Um, and so I think that what this reveals is, uh, again, what I would say, um, what needs to be in place for them to work some of the time. Um, and what needs to be in place to for, for them to work some of the time is this sort of in incredible agitation um, and, and calls for authenticity. Um, but I do think that that gap is absolutely key, not just for these models, but also global climate change models and all models. The, the gap between a model and reality is the space for political action and poetic thought. Yes, that's a fantastic um, yeah, that's a good claim um, to vision <laughs> and call for action, let's say. So I want to thank uh, Wendy, Alex, and Mercedes for this fantastic conversation. And I look forward to finishing the book, which I'm in the middle. It's really fantastic, so, so great. And I also want to thank uh, Alex and Emma, who uh, supported us technically and distributed this information about this event to all of you. And I thank all of you who came here, listened to the conversation and supply fantastic questions. So thanks again, everyone. And uh, hopefully you have a good day or evening or hours. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to close. All right. Thank you again, everyone. See you around. Thank you.